Hello everyone, my name is Brant Kudrowski and this organic chemistry video covers the preparation of alcohols, ethers, and epoxides by SN1 and SN2 reactions. Synthesizing alcohols can be done either through SN1 or SN2 depending on the substitution of the alcohol. The SN2 reaction is best for primary alcohols. For example, here's a primary alcohol. It could be synthesized from a primary alkyl halide where X could be chloride, bromide, or iodide and the nucleophile for the SN2 reaction would be a strong one, it'd be hydroxide. Hydroxide could come in and attack the primary alkyl halide, displace the leaving group, and give a primary alcohol. SN2 is a good choice for primary alcohols because they come from primary alkyl halides and those are good substrates for SN2 reactions. Use an SN1 reaction if you need to make a tertiary alcohol. Here's an example of a tertiary alcohol. This carbon's really hindered and it wouldn't be possible to do an SN2 reaction with hydroxide on this type of substrate. In this case, you'd need to start with a tertiary alkyl halide, and if this is put in with a weak nucleophile water, an SN1 reaction will happen. A tertiary carbocation will form as the leaving group leaves, and then the nucleophile will attack that tertiary carbocation and give a tertiary alcohol. You can use SN1 or SN2 for secondary alcohols. Now bear in mind there are potential problems with all of these reactions. One potential problem is elimination reactions can compete. This is a big problem with SN1, but it can also be a problem with SN2 as well. SN1 reactions will generate mixtures of stereoisomers if the reaction is occurring at a stereogenic center. That's a problem if you're trying to make a chiral alcohol. We'll work some practice problems on this slide. We'll start with the upper problem. This is a primary alcohol, and primary alcohols can come from primary alkyl halides. This is the bond we'll need to form here. This is a good substrate for SN2 reactions because primary substrates are not very hindered and therefore for SN2 we're going to need a strong nucleophile. We're going to want to bring in hydroxide. Then the alkyl halide brings in all the atoms on the right side of the molecule, all the carbon atoms, and a leaving group. For the lower structure, this is a tertiary alcohol, and tertiary alcohols can come from tertiary alkyl halides. We'll be forming this bond in the reaction, and this is a good candidate for SN1 because tertiary alcohols come from tertiary alkyl halides, and tertiary alkyl halides are good substrates for SN1 reactions. So we'll need a weak nucleophile here, and in this case we're going to bring in water as our nucleophile, and our alkyl halide here will just be all of the carbon materials with a leaving group and we've just picked bromine here. Ethers can also be synthesized by SN1 and SN2. We're going to talk about SN1 reactions on this slide. SN1 is useful for making bulky ethers. This is particularly true if one of the R groups would be a tertiary or secondary carbocation because these are good stable carbocations. Here's an example with an ether that has one of its R groups being very bulky. This could come from a tertiary carbocation for example. And if we made the bond here, if we think backwards, the left side of the molecule could be our weak nucleophile. And thinking backwards, this could come from a tertiary carbocation and our weak nucleophile, which would be methanol. Then the tertiary carbocation could come from a tertiary alkyl halide like this. Thinking backwards like this is a useful way to solve these kinds of problems. On this slide, we're going to talk about how you can make ethers using an SN2 substitution reaction. This has a name associated with it, and it's called the Williamson ether synthesis. SN2 reaction is useful for making non-bulky ethers. This is particularly true if one of the R groups could be either a primary alkyl halide or a methyl halide. Let's synthesize the ether below using an SN2 reaction. There are two potential routes that we could take. We could either think of forming that bond in an SN2 reaction, and I'll represent that pathway in red, that would mean that the left side of our molecule would be the alkyl halide side and the right side would be the nucleophile. And since this is an SN2 reaction, the nucleophile is going to be strong. This reaction would proceed by nucleophile attacking the alkyl halide and leaving group leaving. That's one option. The other option would be to form the bond shown here at the blue line. I'll represent that pathway with a blue arrow. In this pathway, the left side of the molecule would be the nucleophile side, and the right side would be the alkyl halide side. And then in this reaction, the nucleophile would attack this alkyl halide, displace the chlorine, and give the ether product. There are differences in these routes, though. The upper route has a secondary alkyl halide, and SN2 reactions are difficult with secondary alkyl halides. Whereas the lower route, the SN2 reaction is with a primary alkyl halide, and SN2 reactions are much easier with primary alkyl halides. So in this case, of the two options, the lower route is better. We'll work through some practice problems on this slide. We'll do the upper one first. Here, we've got an ether that has two groups that are fairly bulky on either side, cyclopentyl on one side and a tert-butyl on another side. This is a good candidate for an SN1 type process to put this ether together, so let's consider the two alternatives. We could 
think of constructing the bond on the left side indicated by the dotted blue line, in which case that would work back to a carbocation on a secondary carbon on the five-membered ring. The other option would be to form the bond indicated by the red dotted line. That would work back to tert-butyl carbocation. There's a stability difference between these carbocations. The red pathway is tertiary, the blue pathway is a secondary carbocation, and tertiary carbocations are easier to form and that's likely to be a much better reaction. So that carbocation will be our target carbocation and our reaction will be SN1. Since we're doing an SN1 mechanism, we're gonna need a weak nucleophile and the nucleophile needs to be the left side of our molecule, so it's going to be an alcohol on the five-membered ring shown here. The alkyl halide needs to produce a tert-butyl carbocation, and that could be the tert-butyl chloride molecule shown here. In the lower example, we have an ether whose R groups are not bulky. This is a good candidate for synthesis by an SN2 mechanism because the groups are fairly unhindered. There are two options. Let's consider the option on the left side, making that bond indicated with the blue line. That would work back to an alkyl halide that has this structure, which is primary. The other option would be to make the bond that's indicated by the red dotted line, and that would work back to an alkyl halide that has this structure and is methyl. Since SN2 reactions are sensitive to steric hindrance, the methyl option is the better option, so that's the alkyl halide that we should use. Our reaction will be SN2, and we'll just draw the alkyl halide that we came up with in the alkyl halide box. Now for nucleophile, we're gonna need a strong nucleophile to get this SN2 reaction to proceed properly. The strong nucleophile is gonna to need to comprise all the atoms in the left side of the molecule, left of where the red dotted line is. That would be this strong nucleophile, which is called an alkoxide nucleophile. This slide goes into more depth on the Williamson ether synthesis. This is an SN2 reaction between an alkyl halide and an alkoxide nucleophile. This is review from chapter seven. The reaction starts with an alkyl halide that should be relatively unhindered. That reacts with an alkoxide nucleophile in an SN2 reaction. The nucleophile attacks the alkyl halide, displaces the halogen, and that gives an ether product and the leaving group. Alkoxide nucleophiles are formed from deprotonation of alcohol, so if you have access to an alcohol, you can make it into a better nucleophile by deprotonating it. Consider the following generic alcohol. It's a weak nucleophile. If that gets put in with a base like sodium hydride, the base can deprotonate the alcohol, which generates an anion called an alkoxide nucleophile. Here, the oxygen functions as a strong nucleophile and can be used in an SN2 substitution reaction. The other product is hydrogen gas. The reactions in the Williamson ether synthesis sometimes go together. Sometimes you're given an alcohol, you need to deprotonate it, and then put in an alkyl halide to do an SN2 reaction. Sometimes Williamson ether synthesis questions come in two parts, making the nucleophile and doing the SN2 reaction. We'll work some Williamson ether synthesis practice problems on this slide. We'll start off with the top reaction. We have an alcohol reacting with sodium hydride. Sodium hydride is a strong base. It might help to redraw it in this form where you can see the lone pair on hydride and its formal negative charge. Then that base deprotonates the alcohol H, giving an alkoxide nucleophile that has this structure. Now that it's a strong nucleophile, it can react in an SN2 reaction with this alkyl halide, iodomethane, where the nucleophile attacks the carbon, displaces the iodide leaving group, and an ether forms. In the second reaction, we have to think backwards back to what would be a reasonable starting material to start with. In the second step, we're told that we use ethyl bromide as a reagent. The ethyl group is highlighted here in the starting material. If we look, we can find the ethyl group in the product. It turns up there. That suggests that we need to make the bond between the oxygen and the ethyl group, and that the oxygen species, our nucleophile, will be the larger of the two pieces. This structure could come from the following alkoxide nucleophile through reaction with the alkyl halide shown in an SN2 reaction. We just need to draw the corresponding alcohol that it would come from via deprotonation with sodium hydride, which is the alcohol shown here. The next slide covers synthesizing epoxides by an SN2 reaction. When a molecule has a leaving group and a hydroxy group on adjacent carbons, epoxides can form through something called an intramolecular SN2 reaction. This is where both the alkyl halide and the nucleophile components are contained in one molecule. We'll show an example of that. Think about this alkyl halide where we have a bond to a leaving group, chlorine, and then on the next door carbon, there's an OH group, an alcohol. This molecule, if it was treated with sodium hydride, would become an alkoxide nucleophile. The sodium hydride would deprotonate the alcohol and generate an alkoxide, which is a strong nucleophile. And now we have a species that has a strong nucleophile and a good leaving group all in the same molecule. This molecule is poised to attack itself, and that's what happens in the next step. 
the nucleophile attacks and displaces the chloride leaving group. It's called an intramolecular SN2 reaction because the molecule is essentially attacking itself. It's almost like a snake biting its tail, and the result is a ring. If you found this video useful, check out the next one in the series or watch the prior video. And consider subscribing to my YouTube channel. My name is Brant Kudrowski. Thanks for watching.